Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Very good morning to you, and you're welcome to today's Signpost webinar. We have today a very interesting topic in relation to solar PV, and today we'll be exploring the potential of solar PV technology in Ireland's agricultural sector. And over the past number of years, there's been huge interest in this area, and we're delighted to be joined by Barry Caslin, who's Energy and Rural Development Specialist and our resident expert on renewable energies in, Ch in Chagask. Uh, Barry, you're very welcome to today's webinar. Good morning, Mark. How are you today? Great, great. And Pat, you, good morning to you. How are you today? Great. Good, good. So, Barry, could you tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing in Chagas? I know you've quite a diverse portfolio, but you, you have uh, been spending a lot of your time more recently in uh, the whole area of renewable energy because there's an awful lot happening there in that whole policy space and, and funding space. Yeah, I suppose as part of the whole green agenda as well is, is, the, is the decarbonization of our, of our energy. And I suppose agriculture has a big role to play in all of that. Because uh, you know, there's certain there's a load of different renewable technologies out there uh, that farmers would have a role to play. And so, solar PV, which we're going to talk about today, which is microgeneration, is a role for farmers in that. And so, I suppose really it's about getting that information out there about how this technology can benefit farmers, how they can avail of it, what kind of supports are available, what kind of paybacks are there. There's you know we've had false dawns with other technologies in the past like energy crops we've had um you know um other areas now where we're looking at at the moment is biomethane is potentially an opportunity for farmers maybe to get involved in ad plants maybe to in anaerobic digestion and that's producing a replacement for natural gas uh, so biomethane is essentially produced from biomass material organic material and it goes through the anaerobic digestion process, producing biogas, which is upgraded to biomethane. So there's opportunities there for farmers to get involved in, in that space as well, maybe be, by being suppliers of grass into, on a contractual basis into a, a digester, maybe supplying slurry, maybe taking back digestate, which is a, a nutrient-rich fertilizer, and spreading that onto their grassland and being a replacement for chemical fertilizer. So there's a lot of opportunities emerging and then of course then there's opportunities for maybe for community projects in in the future through small scale generation many farmers are looking at larger projects as well such as you know where potentially we would have maybe 30,000 acres covered in solar pv panels by 2030 if our climate action targets are to be achieved uh, and this is again is part of the decarbonization of our electricity because mm -hmm. the majority of our electricity in ireland is produced from gas and uh, well, 50% of it will be produced from gas. and then, we, But of course, we have a lot of renewables in terms of wind coming on stream there as well. Farmers in some situations are hosting wind turbines on their farm um, and getting remuneration for that, getting a payment for it. So that's, a, I suppose, a land use opportunity and a diversification opportunity, as is the hosting of panels, solar PV right. panels on the farm. So it's, it's exploring all those areas and... They're very diverse in their own right, from going from biomass to different types of technologies. Uh, so uh, really, that's the, <laughs> the area yeah, I'm involved right. in. So quite, it is quite a wide portfolio, along with the rural development stuff. It was interesting. I think I saw that Ireland produced uh, one third of its uh, energy last year using wind energy, which is a very significant uh, departure. I think we're, we're leading the way in, in, in that, that whole area. Um, but of course, we have so many sheds across the country that uh, could accommodate solar panels. I think uh, there's a very good fit here. And it's no surprise that there's been a lot of interest in this whole area from farmers. So, Barry, we'll hand over to you and chat to you afterwards. OK, thanks, Mark. OK, so I'll just kick off by maybe giving people an idea about, you know, where the energy is used on farms in Ireland at the moment. And just you can see this table here of on dairy farms, for example, and who are who are the typical users of this particular type of technology, such as solar PV? So when I talk about solar PV in in, the, in today's context, it's in the microgeneration context. So it's between naught and fifty kilowatt systems. So just to put that in context, a typical domestic dwelling house would maybe put up um, maybe a, a four to six kilowatt system, whereas farms and uh, would be looking at systems maybe from uh, from 15 to 50 kilowatts and maybe I may be even higher depending on what the electricity use is 
But I'll go through that after a while in terms of what a kilowatt will deliver in terms of energy on an annual basis. And that will give you a, a, an idea about the potential output of these systems. But just, I suppose, where is electricity used on farms? So if you look at, uh, you know, um, dairy farms, you can see here, you know, the majority of the energy is used. And th these are the typical kilowatt hours per cow per year. And you have typical scenarios and you have best practice scenarios for where you're implementing the, the I suppose, the, the best practices. So field operations as tractor use, uh, you know, that's where the majority of energy is used uh, with tractor diesel um, on, on farms. Then milk cooling then is coming in uh, next and be uh, typically around 133 kilowatt hours per cow per year. Uh, and in a best practice scenario, maybe where you have variable speed drives, um, you know, you, uh, you, you are, uh, or sorry, better cooling techniques, you, have, you might be down to 65 kilowatt hours per cow. Um, water heating, 126 kilowatt hours per cow per year, maybe in best practice scenarios down to 70. So you can see there, that's typically where the energy is used on your dairy farms. Poultry units, again, um, and, you know, it's kilowatt hours per 100 kilograms of meat in a broiler situation, you know, and there's best practice examples and there's uh, typical examples. So you can see there's quite a bit of variation there, and that's maybe down to the efficiency of broiler houses, of the units themselves. So you can be varying from 61 kilowatt hours per 100 kilograms of meat down to uh, 29 kilowatt hours per 100 kilograms of meat. Uh, and that's from between ventilation, lighting, uh, feed systems. A lot of the energy is there is, is on heating and, of course, a lot of um, in, in poultry situations and, of course, in pig situations, they're looking at biomass boilers for the heating. So moving away from fossil fuels and many uh, poultry units and pig units have put in biomass boilers to replace the, uh, the 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 kerosene or maybe the the propane gas that's been used in, in on those farms, and of course they can avail of the SSRH, that's the support scheme for renewable heat, which is available from SEI, and that's quite an attractive scheme. That might be something that you would want to cover uh, on a different occasion about how that how that works in terms of payments. And again, on pig farms, quite a bit of variance in terms of kilowatt hours per pig produced. Uh, you know, you have best practice scenarios which range range from 36 kilowatt hours in a typical uh, scenario down to 16 kilowatt hours on best practice. So again, it's uh, uh, the farrowing unit would, would use most of the heat, and that's where a lot of units are put in the biomass boilers. Uh, then you have the the uh, ventilation and lighting, uh, motor power pumping, conveying, uh, feed augers, pumping, scraping. So there's a lot of electricity being used on those situations as well. So I suppose they're the three main enterprises that will benefit from the use of solar PV uh, and putting on this particular technology because there is a lot of electricity being used between pig units, poultry units and uh, dairy units. And of course, I don't have a site here, but the horticultural sector, but again, they use quite a bit of electricity as well in greenhouses um, and uh, mushroom units. So again, a lot of electricity being used there and they're ones that should be considering this as well. Just wanted to make people aware as well that there are there is a, um, a voucher system in operation by SEI at the moment that where you can conduct an energy audit on your farm and there's a two thousand euro voucher to do that. So what these audits essentially do is they identify where the energy has been used, what equipment and the is consuming the the most of it. They're able to submit her as well and maybe look at where, you know, the difference between uh, energy being used maybe for pumping water on the farm to maybe motive equipment uh, and identify maybe ways of saving that electricity. It could be saving electricity, gas or diesel maybe on the farm. In order to avail of that voucher, you have to have an annual electric uh, energy spend of €10,000 per year. Um, so the audits... They look at you know milk cooling. There could be hot water pipes uh, monitoring the 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 pumps, the lighting, and maybe heat recovery as well. Um. So moving on to what we want to I suppose talk about today is the components of a solar system. So you, the main components of uh, a system is the PV panels themselves. Then you have the inverter. The inverter is a key unit in in it, uh, and this will be covered under the TAMS grant as well converting direct current into alternating current or DC into AC. And that's what we require in our houses, in our sheds, in our in our businesses, in, in the AC form we plug into with the mounting brackets and then the, the grid protection. Um, 
panels are differentiated based on the semiconductor material, which is um, monocrystalline panels. Um, they're, they're more expensive, but they're the most efficient. Uh, that's the typical panels that will be used um, you know, right across Europe. And you know, the standard solar PV panels, the size of them is 1.66 meters by one meters. And um, the output of these panels has been increasing over the last number of years. And I suppose anyone who's buying a system, that's a typical question that you would ask. If you're buying a 1.66 by one uh, meter panel, what is the output of those panels? And, you know, the output is, is 320 uh, watts to 400 watts per panel. And in order to convert that to kilowatts, we divide that figure by a thousand. So that's 0.32 kilowatts to 0.4 kilowatts per panel. And they're actually going higher than that. Some of the panels are up at 0.45 or maybe, and, they're, and they are going higher. But in some cases, they might be bigger than the 1.66 uh, by one meter size. So that, that might be the variance there. So the type of monocrystalline panels that are available, you have, there's two main types. You have the glass foil, and um, which is glass on a foil laminate. And they're the most standard type of panel. Most houses are putting these in. Um, they have a 25 year, generally a 25 year performance guarantee. And these would be the kind of questions that you would ask your supplier, what type of performance guarantee is with them. Um, yeah, the PV cells are placed between a, a pane of glass on top and there's a foil laminate uh, underneath. That's um, how they're composed. Uh, the, the other type then is more of a premium product. It's called a glass on glass uh, product. The, they typically would have a 30 year performance guarantee. They're a, are a more robust type panel. So the PV panel is between two panes of glass and um, the cells are better protected from the environment. Uh, certainly, if you're in a coastal area, saline area, you know, and, and ideally on farms as well, you know, where there's more corrosion, maybe with ammonia as well, and um, more potential corrosion. Uh, th this is the type of panel that you'd be looking at in those kind of situations. They would have a longer life expectancy. Uh, and then they have a degradation rate of 0.34% um, per year. So it's a, a lower degradation rate than you'd have on your glass on uh, glass on foil laminate type panel. And again, that's a type of uh, typical question you would ask a supplier, what was the expected degradation rate? And these are typically manufactured in the EU as well. And what I talk about in degradation rate is, you know, in the first year, you'll have your highest output. And every subsequent year after that, the output per panel will decrease by maybe between 0.34% in the case of glass on glass, um, and it could be over 0.5% in the case of glass and foil laminate type panels. So you'll have a, um, there's a, a, there is a difference in price between glass and foil and glass on glass. Uh, there's probably a 20, 25% difference in price uh, between those two types of panels. So the key points here is that there's two main types of panels on the market. You have the glass on glass and the glass and foil laminate. Uh, look out for panels, the stated efficiency, uh, the degradation rate, and the performance guarantee. Um, something that people need to be aware of as well is that dirt, dust, and gases around farms, so ammonia gases mainly, uh, means that farmers need to select the more robust type panels and ensure they last. In Ireland, I suppose dirt or dust isn't as big an issue as it would be in Spain or Portugal and some of those countries where they do have to clean the panels more frequently. We get a fair bit of rain in this country, as we all know, and that does keep our panels washed. But there will be a, a cleaning requirement on them as well, and that's something just to be aware of. Mm, so, um, look closely at the terms and conditions of the panels and the warranty before purchasing the system. Um, there's a lot of suppliers out there at the moment, and there's a lot of people being offered, um, and many of these companies have not been in business for a long number of years, haven't been around quite um, you know, long enough to... I suppose, um, I suppose, uh, have any strong credentials, but you know there are a number of them who have been working in the agri sector for quite a bit, quite a number of years at this stage, and do have a, some track records that they can stand by. Um, <clears throat> so, and again, your standard solar PV panels are one point six six meters by one meters, and the output per panel is can be anywhere between 0 0.3, 32 kilowatts to 0 0.4, uh, maybe up to 0 0.45, 0 0.48. What, uh, kilowatts per panel. In terms of looking at is solar right for your farm, 
Um, this just kind of looks at, um, you know, the typical profile maybe during the month of June. And you can see here, I just move the cursor over this here. You can see here that, you know, at this time from maybe from four o'clock in the morning, you're starting to generate electricity. A certain amount of that, all this area here in the green is where that uh, electricity is being consumed in the building. It might be used for milk cooling, for, or it might be used for, uh, you know, you're, you're making use of it. At this time, maybe um, this uh, is exported if it's not being used to meet the building demand in this area here. It could be exported back to the national grid and you're getting paid to export it back to the grid. And you can see here on a typical summer's day as well, <clears throat> the output is, is higher than the demand is. So again, in this area here in the middle of the day, 12, 11, 10, 11, 12, 1 o'clock in the, in the day, you're exporting that excess electricity back to the grid. As the solar output decreases here, the building starts to use more electricity in the evening, and then you're you're, you're consuming it all yourself. In the case of microgeneration, you're getting your best payback when you're using the electricity yourself, because if you're buying in electricity at 30 cent, 35, 40 cent per kilowatt hour, depending on what, who you're dealing with, I know all the rates and tariffs have come down recently. Um, but if, if you're if you're offsetting that requirement to buy it in at that high price, you're getting a better payback than selling it because the prices that you're getting for selling it are maybe 12 to 15 cent per kilowatt hour. Uh, maybe in some cases there are offers of up over 20 cent per kilowatt hour. So, But the best payback is for you using all the electricity yourself. And this is an example of maybe on a dairy farm, you know, where, you know, um, you're this area here in green is where the output, the solar PV output has been used to meet the demand of the building, all this area in here. And, you know, the cows go out to graze in the middle of the day. So all you're, all you're using here down here in this green area is here for the milk cooling. So you're not, you're not, you don't have any demand for electricity, but here in the, in the morning milking, you have this peak in demand, you have a need, demand in the evening as well. Um, and, this demand probably won't be met. You will have to import a certain amount of electricity from the grid for this, and you will have to import electricity here as well. It's, and that's the typical demand profile for um, a dairy herd. Um, and this area in here in, in, in between is where the solar PV output is exported. It's used to meet uh, because it's not required to meet the building demand. So you're exporting here and uh, you know, you're exporting to whoever you're buying your electricity of. You're doing a deal with them to get a, a fair price for the, for the, for that electricity that you're exporting back to the grid. Just the orientation <clears throat> of the panels themselves. You can see here, this is a chart from the SE, SEI publication. And you can see here, like, a, a southern orientation is, is most important. So the, and the tilt of it will be between... Uh, around 45 degrees and that would be the typical tilt 40 to 45 degrees that you would have on uh, on most traditional roof pitches in Ireland so you can see here you know this is where you're getting your your best output if you have a business that really required um, um you know um, electricity in the morning time a south a southeast orientation could be better if you required the electricity in the evening southwest orientation could be better so you have to look at the, the roof pitches to determine that. Most of the companies use a European Commission. Um, and the, the companies, in terms of the technology providers, the panel providers, they would use um, a piece of technology called PVGIS. So it's free and freely available for um, all the companies to use and to determine what roof pitches are, are best suited in terms of the orientation and the tilt of the roofs. To uh, to meet the I suppose the the maximum solar gain. So and just Barry, while you're on that slide, I mean, are there many people who are trying to match their kind of morning and evening demand by orientating the panels maybe towards the the the, uh, the east or west or the southeast or southwest to to try to better or is there much of a benefit in doing that? Yeah, there is. There is. Yeah. And certainly in a dairy situation, if you have the roofs, maybe southwest, if you have southwesterly facing roofs, that will maximize for your morning milking. If you have them southeasterly facing, that will be maximized. Sorry, southeasterly facing for the morning milking, southwesterly facing for the evening milking. That does make sense. So the, 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 that, that's what people will be doing. And in some situations, Mark, you don't have that luxury of having your buildings in the most suitable locations. You might, you might have certain buildings that don't really suit 
in terms of their the stability of the roof, that they're just not structurally sound enough. Mm-hmm. And you may have to ground mount the panels. And that's also a possibility as well to get them in the optimal location. Um, another terminology I just wanted to introduce you to here is this thing called capacity utilization factor. So this is the percentage of the full output of that system in generating over the course of a year. So if you put up, you know, a 100, now I'm, this is 100 kilowatt system. So I said a typical house would use maybe a, five, a four, five or six kilowatt system. But you won't get 100 kilowatts of output all year round, 24 hours a day. So there's, um, so there's 8,760 hours per year. So if you multiply the um, the 8,760 hours by the 100, um, you know, that would be potentially, if, if, if it was, if you had sunshine all night long and you had uh, optimal conditions where solar was generating electricity all the time, you would be generating 876,000 kilowatt hours of electricity per year with that. But generally you don't have that. You have what's called a capacity. You, you might be only getting eight, maybe nine and a half percent of that. That would be more a reasonable figure to be aiming for. That's called the capacity utilization factor. So if you take go back to your domestic dwelling house, if you put up a five kilowatt system, you take five and you multiply it by that figure of 8,760, which is the hours in a, in a in a calendar year, and take the capacity utilization factor of nine and a half percent, and you're multiplying that um, by that, it's 4,161 kilowatt hours of electricity per year. So a five kilowatt system, some people think that a five kilowatt system will deliver 5,000 kilowatt hours of electricity per year. That's not the case. And it may be the case, maybe in certain years, if you're in the sunny southeastern in an optimal location, but generally you won't be getting that kind of output. Um, so the uh, capacity utilization factor of nine and a half percent, maybe it could be as low as eight uh, percent, depending on where you are in the country and where the sun is shining, and the, of course the location of your pa- of your panels as well. That'll determine that. Just to put that in context as well, a typical house would use. Uh, uh, about between four to five thousand kilowatt hours of electricity per year. So if you look at your electricity bills over the previous twelve months and add it all up together for a domestic dwelling house, now um, you would probably be used maybe uh, between four thousand and five thousand kilowatt hours of electricity per year. So the average for Ireland is around four thousand, and that includes apartment buildings, everything right across the country. But um, you know, a typical dairy farm, maybe with a one hundred cow herd might be using 35,000 kilowatt hours of electricity per year. So that's so th- that's really what you're looking at when you're trying to size these systems as well, is what your previous electricity use is. And when I come onto the TAMs after a while, this these this kind of figure will be important because the department do look at this, but they don't use a capacity utilization factor of 9.5% when they're determining this. They pick a figure of um, each kilowatt say so in this situation, a five kilowatt system, there's an assumption there that a five kilowatt system will deliver 5,000 kilowatt hours per, of electricity per year. So this is um, a, a bit of a bone of contention with uh, with some farmers at the moment because that they're, they're, they're restricted in the size of their system based on their previous electricity use. And that determines how much or what size of the system they're allowed to apply for under the TAM scheme. But I'll get to that after a while. So hopefully that puts this in context in terms of the capacity utilization factor, what a panel will deliver in terms of kilowatt hours or units of electricity per year. Um, So 2023 was a significant year for solar PV and we had the introduction of the micro generation. Um, uh, We had the elimination of of panning requirements for panels. Um, so that was a big ch- um, change. Now, unless you're in a solar safeguard zone, which is maybe beside an airport, um, those solar safeguard zones you can go, you can just Google solar safeguard zones and you can see where they're located across the country. If you have to be happen to be beside one of those, that will restrict you in terms of this, um, and you will have to go for planning there. Uh, there's a new simplified grid connection policy, which I'll come to in a while, and we've had the revision to the VAT regulations. So there's no VAT on solar PV panels now. And we also have the introduction of the 60% grant through TAMS. That's both for the farm and the farmhouse. And that's quite significant because 
you know, even beef farmers can qualify for this now, where they don't really have a demand on their farm um, in the sheds, but they're not allowed to put the panels onto the roof of the house, but they can put it on their sheds at the back of their house or their farm in the field at the back of their house, they can ground mount it there. So that's of interest maybe to beef farmers. So it's not just dairy, poultry, pigs and horticulture that I mentioned earlier that can benefit from this times. Beef and sheep farmers can also benefit from it as well. And pay, paybacks are generally between two to four years. And I always say anytime you have a payback of under um, of under five years, that's a good deal. You have the option of selling electricity back to the grid as well. There was a lot of, I suppose, uncertainty about this over the last a couple of years as microgeneration has been talked about as the introduction of the TAM scheme has been talked about, the TAM's tree scheme. Um, there was uncertainty. Could you sell your electricity back to the grid? Yes, you can sell them back to the grid, but where the department does limit you on the system is you can't put, start put, putting up a massive system on your sheds. You're really, it, it will depend on what your previous electricity usage was. And so the system, this is not about diversifying and selling electricity to the grid microgeneration. This is about meeting your own on farm requirements. So the roof conditions, solar PV systems are not particularly heavy, but the roof must be safe for the purpose of access for the installers and for uh, and and for the maintenance of the panels afterwards for cleaning them. Solar PV can sometimes increase wind uplift effects. So it is important that they're not just put onto any roof, that they're structurally sound. Um, you know, if the roof is in poor condition, some repair or reinforcement may be required. Uh, alternatively, if you have the space, you can choose to ground mount the systems, check with your supplier. I think it's important here. I have seen certain situations where uh, PV systems were being recommended for roofs, which really weren't fit for purpose. And it might be just a case of reinforcing those roofs, putting in better timbers before they are before before they are um, put on those roofs because and I think it's important to contact insurance companies as well and make them aware that panels have gone up because you are putting up a system that could be maybe 20,000, 30,000 euro uh, on farms or, or, or maybe more expensive in some situations. So this is um, something that does need to be insured as well. And you do, do need to make sure that your, your system is uh, has, has, has insurance. And, you know, you could get falls of snow or anything like that that could add to it. So... What, what what is the impact of a fall of snow, for example, on a, a roof mounted system? Is the roof uh, capable of taking that ex extra extra burden? Battery storage comes up quite a bit as well, and batteries are covered under TAMS also at 60%. So there's lots of different brands out there. Batteries operate, I mentioned the alternating current and the direct current. So batteries can be charged in direct current by surplus solar during the day. And once they're discharged, they can be recharged on the cheaper nitrate electricity for discharge again in the morning. So that's uh, the operate in both alternating current and indirect current. So the batteries act as a backup, as a as a power backup. Um, they are making sense now at um, uh, now that they're available at six percent grant 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 rate. You can only get up to fifty percent of the kilowatt output of your panels as in terms of battery storage. So just to put that in context, if you put up a 20 kilowatt PV system, you can only get grant aid in TAMS for half that, which is a 10 kilowatt hour, a kilowatt, kilowatt hour storage system. So that is the um, the, the support that's available there. So it's, a, it's if you want to go higher in terms of, um, you know, uh, maybe a, say a 15 kilowatt hour battery storage system, you can do so but you have to do it at your own expense. The, the, the TAMS grant will only give you grant aid of 50% of the kilowatt output capacity of the, of the panels themselves. So in that example that I just give, a 20 kilowatt PV solar array system will, will uh, warrant a, a 10 kilowatt hour battery system. So in terms of the solar capital investment scheme, and this is the part of CAP uh, that is of, um, this is the part, part of the TAMS 3. So it's um, every eligible farmer is, they, they, they can get inverters, the panels, the controllers, the cabling, the isolation switches, they're all covered under the solar capital investment scheme under TAMS 3. So it is necessary to go to your advisor, whether that's a Chagas advisor or a private advisor to get uh, to, to you know to to get this application submitted um it falls under a standalone investment ceiling which is 
ninety thousand euro without affecting the, um, um, the the ability to avail of other TAMS measures. In the previous TAMS and TAMS two, solar was granted at forty percent, but it also ate into the uh, uh, investment ceiling for doing other work, such as putting in tanks or buildings. But now this is a standalone investment ceiling of ninety thousand euro, which is available under this rural development program period. So it is quite a, an attractive, um, um, you, you know, the fact that it's not, uh, you know, you can do this type of environmental sustainability work and it doesn't eat into your other um, TAMS monies over that period. And that happened to a lot of farmers who had built sheds over, over the last number of years. They built the sheds and, but, and then discovered that they had no money left to put up PV panels, so that, that won't be an issue this time around. But you are limited, like the 90,000 ceiling would get you probably 62 kilowatts is, is, is the maximum uh, that, you, that you could get. But as I say, most farms will be probably going, if you're on single phase, maybe going for a 20 kilowatt, 22 kilowatt system. And maybe if you're on three phase, depending on your usage, you might be going for maybe higher 30, 40 kilowatt system. So most dairy farms will not be using a 62 kilowatt system, but certainly poultry units, pig units, they would be maxing that. They would certainly be um, put up much larger systems, like a hundred kilowatt system would not be, or, or higher would not be um, out, out of the question for a, 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 a poultry unit, for example. Solar panels costs vary depending on the type, uh, the quality, and the system size. So if your solar quote is over the reference costs, you pay the difference. Um, and the first tranche has. Uh, has closed, uh, the, the, the second tranche has actually closed. Uh, the first tranche closed in June of last year, so June of 2023. Uh, there was over 700 applicants in the first tranche. Uh, the second tranche just closed there in the second week of, in the third week of January. Uh, and now we're into the third tranche of TAMS 3. Uh, and that could close in April. Um, I forget the exact date. It could be April the 11th or in, or in around that time. So this, this is going to run in tranches. The first, uh, I suppose, it started off that there was a delay in getting approvals. There was a delay in um, approvals for all types of TAMS uh, um, applications. There was some computer glitches that caused that. But now I think the department are getting into a steady stream. That, that That's all been sorted out. They'll be into a steady stream now of uh, of on a three monthly basis that these applications will be um, will, will be accepted and then it'll close and then uh, then another tranche will open up again. So I think it's those glitches at the start have been now been ironed out. <clears throat> so in terms, I mentioned the reference costs. So the, the departments have reference costs for everything, whether it's tanks or whether it's, do, do, uh, you know, doing sheds, uh, all types of equipment, but the reference costs here in terms of PV panels, are it's one thousand four hundred and forty-one per installed kilowatt, um, plus an installation cost of one thousand eight hundred and forty-nine. Um, so, a ten, if you take a ten kilowatt peak uh, output in kilowatt system, that would work out as one thousand four hundred forty-one multiplied by ten, uh, plus the one eight four nine. That's a maximum investment ceiling of sixteen thousand two hundred and fifty-nine. So, that's sixteen thousand two hundred and fifty-nine out of that reference cost of 90,000 euro that I mentioned on the previous slide, which is the maximum ceiling. So, but what you get a 60% of that as grant aid, which is 9,917. If your costs, if, if, if your quotes go above the 16,259, you have to pay the difference. Uh, you, but you, you only get 60% of this figure here. If your quote is below the 16,259, you get 60% of whatever that quote is or whatever you're paying. Uh, if it's 15,000, for example, then you pay 60% of 15,000. <clears> I mentioned the batteries already. So solar PV um, rechargeable batteries are also eligible for grant aid uh, up to, sorry, this should be 60% of the panel peak. Uh, sorry, that's, that's right, that's right. Uh, grant aid of up to 50% of the panel peak output. That's the, what I mentioned earlier on. So in this in this example here, uh, a 10 kilowatt system, a 10 kilowatt peak system will qualify 50% of that is five. That's a five kilowatt hour battery is what, what's available here. So the, the reference costs here is 720, 703 euro per kilowatt hour. So it's five multiplied by 703 plus this installation cost of 753. 
it's a re- that's 4268 and you get 60% of that so that's 2560 euro and 80 cent is is the grant that will be payable on that again if the reference costs uh, if you go above the reference cost if you're quoted above that you will you will have to pay the difference if you're below it you get 60% of of that lower cost in terms of exporting to the grid all electricity generated from grant aided panels must be used solely for agricultural purposes, and this includes power in the farmhouse. Um, it's not permitted to use the electricity for non-farming or commercial purposes. So if you have some other business uh, going on on the farm uh, that's that's consuming the electricity, that's not allowable uh, to get the 60% grant through TAMS to, to cover that. Um, the regulations aim to prevent farmers having an unfair advantage over uh, other unsupported industries. So, but the department, they kind of stop you from exporting electricity and there's, and there's an understanding that, you know, we have to export electricity from farms at certain times of the day. So where you are restricted is it's on the previous electricity use. And that's what I spoke about earlier on, that that's the, that, that's the limiting factor here is what your previous electricity use was. And that's where you have to do a sur- solar survey. Or the, whoever is installing the panels generally do those sur- solar surveys to determine what your previous electricity usage was over the past 12 months. So to claim a grant, the size of the solar PV system will be determined based on the farm's electricity usage rather than a fixed grant amount. So in, what, what's involved in the solar PV survey? And the survey should include the, the meter points reference number of the electricity meter. So what, that has to be quoted in the survey. The previous 12 months electricity bills. So when your installer comes to you, this is what they'll be looking at is what your previous, the, the, you need to dig out those bills for the previous 12 months and uh, the proposed PV panel output. So again, just to give an example of that, if your previous electricity usage was 10,000 kilowatt hours, uh, um, you'd be limited to a 10 kilowatt system. Uh, the, the department take that figure of 1,000 kilowatt hours uh, per kilowatt output of, of panel. Um, I, I mentioned already that's always not the case because uh, very often can be a, a lot lower than that, depending on what part of, of the country you're in, but that's the figure that, that has been used. Uh, you have to talk, uh, you have to state the proposed battery output and the system mounting specifications. Only one house can be considered in the demand calculation as well. So you can include the house if it's on the same MPRN, uh, you will, if it's the house is on a separate MPRN, you will be doing a separate application for the house, um, but because the farmhouse is allowed, but that will be a separate application because it's on a separate MPRN. The survey will limit the size of panels which you can install, as I mentioned, and the tra- the trans tree unit must be an isolated and discrete system, so it has to be um, separate to uh, any other um, systems. Getting paid, any producer of renewable electricity has the right to export surplus electricity and they get paid what's called the CEG or the clean export guarantee. This is uh, essentially, it's it's like it's, if you're selling your, uh, if you're purchasing your electricity from Electric Ireland or from Pinergy or from SSE or from Borgash or whoever you're buying your electricity from, you would be selling it back to them at the moment. That's the way things are at the moment, but potentially that could change in the future that you're allowed to sell to whoever you want, that you don't have to sell it back to the people that you're buying it from <clears throat> excuse me but um you you so you will be d- um reaching a deal with them on that and those deals vary um from one provider to the next in terms of what they offer you in terms of cent per kilowatt hour and the market can vary from it's even lower than 14 cent it could be down to seven cent per kilowatt hour and some are offering up to 24 cent per kilowatt hour but five so, minutes left because we have quite a few questions coming in. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Ground mounted systems are eligible, but the area of the panels cannot exceed seventy five square meters. So I mentioned there's no planning restrictions um, for roof mounted solar, but for ground mounted solar, they they cannot exceed seventy five square meters. So that would be approximately sixteen kilowatt system, uh, based on the size of those panels, uh, that you could get away with for without a planning requirement for a ground mounted system. And the height of the freestanding array cannot exceed 2.5 meters. 
Um, in terms of grid connection, you have to notify the ESB of your intention to install the panels and export the electricity back to the grid. Uh, this means applying for a new type of grid connection. So the whoever is installing the technology on the roof of your house or your or, or of, of your sheds, they, if if it's a domestic situation, for example, in a, sm a smaller system, you'd be applying what's called an NC6 uh, under the micro generation process. If it's um, if if you're looking for a larger system where you're trying to go for a higher export capacity, you're filling out a form called the NC7. This is where you're talking about mini mini generation. So there's a difference between mini generation and micro generation. So I, I'm going to explain that. Then. Yeah, here we are on this slide. So micro generation, I'll just go to the bottom there, up to six kilowatts for single phase electricity consumption and up to 11 kilowatts for three phase electricity con consumption. Um, that this is what you, and there's there's no connection fees uh, with this. It's a simple inform and fit process, and you um, fill out the NC six form. And generally, the company who's putting in the solar panels for you, they will fill this out for you, the NC six form. Uh, <clears throat> if in most farm situations, then you would be you know looking for the opportunity of exporting back because you can't export back for these larger systems unless you're. Um, and, and, and unless you fill out the NC7 form, there is a connection fee associated with this. Of, it's almost a thousand euro. You can see it there at the bottom. Um, it's up to 17 kilowatts for single phase and up to 50 kilowatts for three phase. So most people are filling out the NC7 form and they're asking ESB networks essentially to say, how far can I go on single phase? How far can I go on three phase? You can potentially go up to 17 kilowatts on single phase, which would mean if you are allowed to go up to that, and this will depend on your transformer capacity in your local area, that will determine how big you can get with that. Uh, and the same with the 50 kilowatt, if you're on three phase, you could go up to 50 kilowatts back through the inverter. That would mean in a 17 kilowatt system, potentially you could have a, a larger panel array, you could be maybe up to a 22 kilowatt PV array. But um, that 22 kilowatt PV array, it's only 17 kilowatts back to the inverter. Uh, um, so the base load on most dairy farms is between two kilowatts and six kilowatts every hour. You get significant peaks in the morning and the evening. Uh, on units where there's a robotic system, the base load is higher. So robotic systems, you get a better distribution of the electricity throughout the day because cows are coming in and out to be milked at different times. So you, you do solar PV suits those systems even more so. So the key is to size the system so that the electricity is used on the home farm. It may be necessary to divert surplus electricity towards heating water uh, or battery storage or for electric vehicles. This is just an example here, just to finish off with on the annual electricity usage just uh, of a typical dairy farm. Uh, this, uh, this, this particular farm, its annual electricity usage is just over 35,000 kilowatt hours per year. Their annual electricity bill is 10,220 plus VAT. Their, their rates for their electricity was 35 cent per kilowatt hour daytime and 15 cent per kilowatt hour at nighttime. Their electricity split was 70% of their electricity was during the day and 30% at night. So the average electricity price is 29 cent per kilowatt hour. The main uses of the electricity was the bulk tank was using 52% of it. The hot water heating was 22%, vacuum pump 19%, lighting 6% and the sump pump 1%. The size of the system that they were putting up, and there was we didn't put a, a battery in on this. Uh, it was a twenty-five kilowatt peak system. The cost of the system was was coming in at thirty-seven thousand five hundred euro. Uh, the annual output of that, so it was a twenty-five kilowatt system. It, wa it wasn't delivering twenty-five thousand kilowatt hours per year. It was delivering twenty-two and a half thousand kilowatt hours per year. Uh, the the TAMS grant was sixty percent. The orientation was east and west. And it was a three phase supply uh, connection and it, it was uh, the export capacity was 30 kilovolt amps. Um, you can see here that the based on all of this, um, you know, and and uh, the, the grant aid at 60 percent was working out at twenty two thousand seven hundred and twenty four. Uh, you can see the, the, the assumptions here. So it's that it's that 25 kilowatt system by one four four one plus this. 1849 installation cost, that's the, that's the TAMS reference cost. So that's the maximum grant available. And the net cost of that system is 15,174. 
uh, and the payback on this based on the annual savings of 6,090 euro was two and a half years. So on top of that, you, there is accelerated capital allowances, which I never put into these paybacks because there is tax benefits that you can, um, uh, if you're in a, a cash rich year and you have facing a tax bill, you can write it off in the year of purchase. So it's not written off over a number of years, like most capital items, it's written off in the year of purchase. Um, and in this situation, they're selling a certain amount of electricity back to the grid at 19 cent per kilowatt hour. So that's worth 285 euro per year as well. Okay, Barry, but that could, we, we're going to have to skip towards the end now. Because, uh, yeah, that's the last slide. Okay, Mark, we, we can leave, we can leave it at that. So, and I can stop sharing. That's 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 the last slide there. Okay, great. Thanks mm -hmm. a lot, Barry. Um, because I, we have lots and lots of questions going through. We have uh, nearly 400 people joining us this morning. So obviously huge interest in this whole area and uh, people see the potential in it. And I suppose it's, the message is getting out there that this is something that uh, people do need to take on seriously, uh, given that uh, the, the payback is the, the, the payback time is 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 quite short. Um, sorry, Pat, I, I think... Uh, I switched off your camera earlier on there, so we'll get you switched back on again. So Pat has been uh, trying to navigate all the the various different uh, questions that are coming through. So, um, but obviously the ba the battery side of things, um, Barry, you talked about there. That's that's quite new, in, in that the SEAI grants had discontinued funding the battery, whereas the TAMS now covers that. Um, I mean, if somebody has an existing system, can you? get the battery funded uh, separately to, yes. to bump that up for to increase your storage capacity. Yep, you can. Yeah. So if you if, if, if you require this battery storage on its own right and you have a system there, you can apply for grant, the grant aid for the battery on its, on its own right. So it's, it's like batteries are, are quite expensive. Um, but, um, you know, when you are getting the 60 percent grant and you are getting your tax relief on it as well, it's making it more attractive. And it just means that you're, um, you know, able to use that electricity rather than selling it off at a low price you're able to store it and use it when you have your peak demand for your electricity yourself mm -hmm. okay Ash, um, huge yeah, of interest. I, I suppose a, a huge number of questions a good few of them you have dealt with i, I suppose they arrived early and, and, and have been dealt with uh, uh by your presentation so we might fly through some of them um there's a question there. If uh, 20,000 acres is the target, uh, where are we at the moment in terms of the acres uh, being used for solar PV and some guide to a year by year basis on which we will reach the 20K? And I suppose uh, certainly in the area I'm operating in here, we're seeing a, a dramatic increase in, in the land area associated with, with uh, solar PV. Uh, I don't know if that's the same right around the country. Okay, so this just, uh, I don't want to confuse people between the two two types of systems. I was mainly speaking there about uh, microgeneration up to 50 kilowatt systems. Uh, so that question relates to larger systems, which comes under the RES scheme, the Renew Renewable Electricity Support Scheme, RESS, and that supports uh, wind generation and solar, solar PV large scale generation, where thousands of acres of land will be covered in solar PV panel um, between now and 2030 and of course beyond as well to meet our climate action targets on, on the energy side. Um, the target is a bit higher than, uh, you know, it, it's it, it, we're going to probably need in the region of around 30,000 acres covered in panels. At the moment, there's probably maybe about, it, we're only at the early stages of it because there's a long lead in time to get these projects off the ground. Planning permission is required. Generally, what, what happens is that farmers are approached by developers who want to develop a project on their land. Uh, and generally they try and get maybe 200 acres in one block. So they might be dealing with you, your neighbor and a few other neighbors, trying to pull them all together to make it economically viable to get the project off the ground. So those systems, <clears throat> those, 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 those projects are, are really, uh, you know, they have to, there's a long lead in time for them. They have to get their planning permission. They have to get a grid connection agreement. And then they have to bid into the res auctions. Some of those projects are at different stages. Um, and they're very, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're very attractive to investors or funders when all those ducks are in a row, such as the grid connection, the planning permission sorted, and then they've bid it into the, into, successfully into the res auction. So they've got, got a guaranteed price for their electricity for a 15 year period. Um, so, you know, 
you will you will see more and more of it um happening over the over over the coming years and you know there's i think you know there's been a number of farms there's probably over a thousand acres of pb panels uh, at at this stage uh, you know so it's it's we're in the early stages of it but uh, you know it, it doesn't take a long time to get a solar pv and um, uh, arrays built uh, there's you know w- w- once all those ducks are are in a row I think I think I saw a figure that last year 0.2% of our um, electricity generation nationally came from solar and they expecting that to go up to something around the, the 2% mark in the current year. So it's I think it's it's moving fairly rapidly at this stage. Uh, I suppose a question there, how much does a typical energy audit cost uh, to qualify for the voucher? Generally, it's, it comes in around that mark, Pat. Uh, it covers it. Uh, there's a couple of questions around the need for washing, and I know you, you mentioned this later on, uh, uh, one case where they're talking about <laughs> on, on tillage farms where you may have dust either from tillage operations or from, from drying, uh, and does that require specialist uh, uh, cleaning operation to be brought in, or is it something that the, the farmer can do themselves? Uh, well, you know, it, it's it's become a very special, a specialized job. And I know from in the UK and in Germany, where I would have seen this happening quite a bit, that a number of uh, of specialized companies work in this area and they come out with their heights for hire, their 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 um, teleporters, and that they're able to go up at, at that height safely, because you know when you are working on, on that incline and roofs, it can be quite dangerous, and uh, trying to bring up water and wash them down as well. So it. Um, it has become very, very specialised. Okay. A, a question in relation to what happens to solar panels at, uh, in terms of, of, I suppose, destruction of the panels at the end of their life. And hopefully we're a long way away from that, but I suppose people are concerned about uh, whether materials are recyclable or, or what's going to happen there. Yeah. And again, we're at the early stages in Ireland, but I, I know that it is happening in France already where they are taking in um, uh, the, the panels and they're able to uh, re- recycle some of the the the, the silicon, the the monocrystalline uh, from those monocrystalline panels. So there is recycling uh, happening, and I, I suppose necess- necessity is the mother of all invention, and we will see more and more of that happening in the future. A que- question in relation to potential development in costs uh, in terms of solar panels and in terms of of uh, batteries, I suppose in particular where there's been a lot of flux in, in, in pricing over the last number of years. What is the prediction there? Uh, and I suppose it'll depend, but maybe to, uh, people's decision on when to invest depends on, on what the costs are going to be now and in the future. The costs of the panels, Pat, came down around 60% from what they were 10 years ago uh, over, the last, over the last two or three years. Uh, but since the war in Ukraine, they started increasing again, and we saw that with inflation in in all areas, so that that we had a, a fair bit of inflation. So, but now we're seeing that level off again, and panel. But there is a lot more competition on the market there now, so we are seeing panel prices, um, coming back down a, a slight bit again. So there's a lot of competition out there, so it's it's well worthwhile shopping around to see where you can get your 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 your, your best deal. But you know, it's hard, it's hard to predict what way it's going to go into the future, but certainly. The cost of the technology has come back um, a lot over the last 10 years since since solar PV um, was first really kicking off all over Europe. Um, and the output of the panels and the efficiency of the panels has improved as well. All right, there's a good few questions here in relation to batteries, um, to, to, to get or not to get a battery uh, seems to be the question. Um, you know, at what point does it make sense? Uh, because I know that there has been a lot of debate as to, you know, when you work out the economics of of, of a battery and the, the price you're getting for exported um, uh, energy. Uh, is there is there a rule of thumb there that you would advise? Or uh, I suppose to. it is, it's kind of, it is, is it down to each person's uh, setup really? Is there their energy yeah. demands, um, uh, particularly at nighttime? It's for, it's very much marked the demand profile on the farm, and every every situation is going to be different. Um, and some situations, if you if you end up exporting, if you if you require, you know, peak electricity in in the morning time, for example, for your morning milking, 
and you don't have it for your evening milking, there is that potential of drawing off your battery. You can charge the battery overnight as well. So every situation needs to be looked at differently. A demand profile established to see does it does it make sense to 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 put in a battery. But you know, it's at a six percent grant, it is looking more attractive now to put in batteries than it ever had. So that energy audit then is a good starting point, really, to, yeah, to try yeah, and establish could, that. Yeah, it could be introduced as part of the energy audit that you might ask the energy auditor to 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 look at is looking at the demand profile of the farm and making the justification for a battery. Exactly. If if there's a or where there's a capacity, one of the ways of using it is is to have an EV and it makes an EV potentially very very viable. But is there a, a, a capacity to feed an EV on the basis of excess capacity, or is it? Uh, just on the basis of the, the requirement of the car to, to, to fill. In other words, can you, uh, I suppose, vary the amount that you're feeding into it depending on what you're supplying? If you, if you have an electric vehicle, that makes a lot of sense because your car battery is, is again, is another way of storing the, that electricity. So if, if you happen to be at home during the daytime and you can charge your car during the day, that makes sense to, to use your electricity in, in, in that way as well. Question on the the uh, oh, I suppose there was there's questions there in relation to whether uh, batteries are essential, but I think you've dealt with that and said that they're not. There's a, a question in relation to uh, the uh, the examples you gave were mostly about animal agriculture. Are horticulture uh, producers eligible for the the grant? Yes, they are. Yeah, they're they're eligible for the for this grant as well. So um, horticulture they have their own grant scheme as well within horticulture. But they are also eligible for this TAMS grant also, yeah. And it, there's a question there in relation to the maintenance costs of, uh, of the, the systems uh, and the, I suppose the levels of, of difficulty that arise with the systems. Are, are they robust or are you trying to get somebody back to, to keep them maintained on a fairly regular basis? Um, they're, they're generally remotely monitored, Pat, so that, you know, if there's any glitches with them or any issues with them, they're monitored remotely by the supplier of the technology, which is, I suppose, a, a, a good thing because you, at least you know that you can call them up at any time and say, you know, and that they know what the issue is with your panel and they can diffuse the problem fairly fast. And um, there's in terms of maintenance, there's very little maintenance with solar PV because you don't have moving parts. With wind turbines, we saw it over the years that rotor blades went, gearboxes went, and you know, in terms of trying to get somebody to replace those, they could be out of action for weeks, months before you got them um, uh, up and running again. So it it is <clears throat> it is quite important that um, you know that 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 people um, get them washed once a year. That would be the main maintenance that would be uh, required with them is the washing. Team okay. Uh, if, we, if, if, you, if you have a film of, of dust on top of them, it, you know it's going to decrease the, the 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 electricity generation potential of them. I'm afraid we're out of time, Barry. You that you you did a, a marathon session there with uh, between questions and the amount of information you covered within the presentation. So. Really, really appreciate your time this morning. Uh, we could easily have another session just having, I think, a Q&A with you. And maybe that's something we could do in the future uh, when when uh, the more of these schemes co uh, come on stream. But uh, we appreciate your your insights and your your expert knowledge in this whole area. So thanks. Thanks for, for your time. Uh, just uh, before we leave, just to remind everybody that um, the, the Chagas GFPD Environmental Sustainability uh, Awards uh, are uh, still open uh, for applications up until the end of uh, February. And so people can submit their applications, uh, whether it's themselves or uh, if you're uh, working in the agri-food sector and you know somebody or if you're a client, uh, please check out uh, the details are on the, the Chagas website. Just uh, type in Chagas Environmental Sustainability Awards and it'll bring you straight to it. Um, Pat, thanks so much for helping with questions. There are an awful lot of questions coming in this morning, so uh, it was a tough job to 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 pull them together. And uh, our thanks to Yvonne Maher, who's in the background, helping with the technology uh, this morning as well. Uh, so next week, we're going to be joined by Noel Meehan, who is uh, as a program manager with Chagask, and uh, we'll be discussing uh, how to maximize uh, the benefits of slurry and uh, minimize the environmental losses. Uh, this is... Uh, 
uh, coming into the season for slurry spreading. So so very good time to be discussing that that matter. So until then, enjoy the weekend and uh, we will talk to you next Friday morning. You've been listening to the podcast version of the Chagisk Signpost series, the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Don't forget to join us live every Friday morning for our latest webinar. For more, visit chagisk.ie. And you can also rate, review and subscribe to the Signpost series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson and thanks for listening.